are finishing our series on the, Bi- the biblical concept of the image of God. It's our third and final message on the image of God from the book of Genesis. And so the first week we talked about how the image of God indicates that we have a purpose. Last week we had this, what I thought was a really fun message, where we looked at about how the image of God gives dignity to people, and it's that dignity, that idea of dignity has transformed the world. Um, and then tonight is uh, an interesting topic, so buckle your seatbelts. It's how the image of God informs and governs our sexuality. So that's the message tonight. Um, and some of you are like, great, an old man who's bald <laughs> and old is going to talk about sex stuff. And you'll get over it. But I would also suggest I've actually had the privilege for 20 years of discipling and teaching the Bible among college students. I've had the privilege of officiating a lot of weddings. Um, And so maybe, just maybe, there's something good, not from me, but from God's Word that I could offer tonight on what is a tense, disputed um, topic in our culture. So the image of God and sexuality is our topic. Um, Now, the topic may seem out of place in a series on the image of God, but when we look at the text in a minute, what we're actually going to see is on the first page of the Bible, the very first page, the very second page, God starts to outline his beautiful design for our bodies, for our genders, for sexuality, and for marriage. From the very beginning, he lays out his design. Um, Although in culture right now, and even in church culture, when I, was, when I was your age in college, there were mixed messages, right? Um, Teresa and I like to joke that when we were in college ministry, the mixed message we got was that sex is dirty, it's gross, and it's something you say for the one you love the very most. So it's like disgusting and precious all at the same time, and it left you a little bit confused. Uh, but if you look at, in our culture, there's three general categories of response to human sexuality. Some people look at sexuality and say it's gross. Boys have cooties. And maybe there's some really strict church cultures. Maybe there's some strict church cultures that have talked so much about God's rules governing sexuality, they haven't extolled the beauty of sexuality, and they've they've left us with the impression it's gross. So some say it's gross. Some say it's God. This is secular culture. Sex is God. Sex is what we give our heart to. It's the identity, the the number one identity we have for ourselves is our gender and sexuality. So sex is gross, sex is God, or the clear teaching of the Bible is that sex is a gift. Marriage is a gift, sexuality is a gift. And I like to say that sex is like fire in a fireplace. And it's powerful. And in the right context, with the right boundaries around it, it's actually very beautiful. You think about a fire in a fireplace on a cold day, and you get some marshmallows in there, and you get to curl up with a book, and it just gives you comfort. It shows beauty. It's just got all these positive attributes until it escapes from its boundaries, and it burns the house down. And so sex is both beautiful, but it's also powerful in its proper place. Um, There are some people in culture who would say the church is too obsessed with sexuality. Like the church is always trying to make rules for people about this kind of stuff. And here's what I would say is the church actually rarely talks about these topics. The culture talks about it way more. Scroll social media, look at the billboards, look at Hollywood movies, and then compare it to your Sunday morning sermons at your church. And you tell me who talks about sex more. Um, Some of you know I'm in this project that I'm doing for school, and we did a survey, and a bunch of you, like 66 or 67 of y'all, filled out my survey a couple weeks ago, and I asked how often your church taught on these topics. And a couple of the results, I asked how often has your church taught on the topic of homosexuality? All you got to do is turn on the news, and it's like in the 24-hour news cycle, that topic, and... 40 out of 66 of you said never or once in your lifetime. Two-thirds of you said never have we addressed that topic or once, and yet it's in the culture's mind all the time. I asked about the topic of transgenderism, which is actually our impact training on Friday. That's our topic. I said, how often has your church addressed that topic? And only, let me think, only four 
out of 67 people said their church had addressed it more than once. And how often is it in the news? How often? Every single day. So maybe it's not the church, but the culture that's obsessed. Um, And tonight, I'm not interested in what Fox News has to say. I'm not interested in what the activists have to say. I'm not interested in what Hollywood has, really not interested in what Hollywood has to say. I'm interested in what Jesus and God's Word has to say. He's Lord, and if we say we follow Him, then what He says is what we uh, go with. So... Tonight, uh, the image of God, just to recap the last two weeks before we jump into tonight's material, two weeks ago, we said that the image of God defines our purpose. And I think we've got a slide kind of recapping. And so our purpose, your purpose, you're made by God to reflect Him, to relate to Him, to represent Him, and to rule or help govern this world on His behalf. And so God has given you a beautiful fantastic purpose. But here's the thing about purpose. God's the one who gives it to you. Your purpose is something you receive, not something you wake up one morning and determine on your own. And sometimes in our culture, culture tends to say, I'm the master of my own destiny and I'm an individual and I have to discover my own purpose when God says, here's your purpose. 1 Corinthians 6 says, you're not your own. You were bought with a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. So two weeks ago was purpose. Last week, we talked about how all people have dignity and how that idea has transformed the world. We did a fun little history lesson about the impact of the image um, on history. The beautiful thing about the image of God and our sexuality is that even when we fall short, you see every one of us in this room is broken somehow in our sexuality. We've all fallen short. We've all sinned. We all have brokenness. But the fact that God's beautiful image is stamped on us means we have dignity and God has grace even when we fail. Even when you fall short, you matter to God. And then tonight, we're jumping into the topic of sexuality and the image of God governs mankind's sexuality. So, three points tonight. Point number one is that God's design for sexuality and marriage is clear and it's good. It's both clear and it's good. And every time the Bible describes marriage and sexuality, the message is consistent. Marriage is a lifelong union of one man and one woman. That is the boundaries, the locus, the location for sexual expression And in that location, God has this miracle of forming a new family and bringing new life into the world. So whenever Genesis describes his design, it always has this biological sex component, male and female. Procreation, starting families, is always part of his design. And I know that the world's not a perfect place, so it doesn't always work out perfectly, but that's its intention. That notion that I've just described has been uncontroversial in all of human history, not just in Christian culture, but in all cultures. One man, one woman, for life, uh, marriage and sexuality. That's, that's like that definition, that picture has been uncontroversial for 5,000 years of human history until five minutes ago. We'll talk under point two about what happened in the 60s and made that controversial. Um, And so what we reject is any departure from that standard. As Christians, we say God's standard is this beautiful thing. And so we reject all the things that are a departure from it. Premarital sex is a departure from God's design. Adultery is a departure from God's design. Divorce is a departure. Homosexuality, transgender ideology, polygamy, spousal abuse, child abuse, all of those things we say have no place among God's people. We'll unpack that more in a minute. But a couple scriptures to guide us. One is the one we've been looking at all along, Genesis 1, 27 and 28, the image of God passage. Genesis 1, 27 says, So God created mankind in His own image, in the image of God. He created them, male and female, He created them. And God blessed them and said to them, And here he's going to give his first command to start families. Be fruitful 
increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it. On the very first page, the Bible affirms the complementing, complementing binary procreative nature of gender, marriage, and sex. Page one. This isn't the, this isn't the 202, this isn't the senior level stuff. This is God's page one for us. You flip to page two, though, in Genesis 2, 20 and 25, we see the first man, the first woman, and God's going God's to describe um, the first marriage. And so Genesis 2, 20, a few excerpts, it says, but for Adam, the first man, no suitable helper, no partner, Was found. So the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man. I love the picture of when God wanted to make the first pair. He he could have made her any way that he wanted, and he made her from his side. The imagery is symbolic because he could have taken her, like a lot of ancient culture said, from his foot because he's meant to rule over the top of her. He could have made her from his head the way maybe some, not all, but some modern feminists say, where she's, it's the, now's the time for women. to It's like women's turn, right? And that's not where she came from. She came from his side to be his partner, to be his complement, to be his side. So God made him from the rib, made her from the rib to be called woman for she was taken out of the man. And he said, that's why a man leaves his father and mother. That's a picture of him becoming, of him starting a new family, leaving one family to start another. He's united to his wife. That's a picture of marriage. And the two become one flesh. Here's what's really cool about that phrase, one flesh. We could, we could make a whole sermon on this. But if you read it in the original language, in the Hebrew, it emphasizes the word one. So if you're reading it literally, it would say, and one flesh, God made them. And it's as if that word one is underlined, bolded, all caps to call attention to it. Now, if you're a Jewish person and you're reading this and you're one of the children of Israel, that word one is etched into your brain because every time, every morning you say it in a prayer, you pray Deuteronomy chapter six, hear, O Israel, the Lord, your God, the Lord is one. So love the Lord with all your heart, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And so the number one declaration of who God was, was God is one. But now he's saying, here whenever he's making the first man and the first woman, he says in some way their union takes two people who are two separate people, and it makes them, bolded, underlined, highlighted, one. Because what that union is meant to do is to remind us of God. Because there's a way in which sexuality and marriage done God's way is a testimony to the world of God. God is Trinity, Father, Son, and Spirit, three persons, but one God. God is the reconciler who takes diverse people from diverse cultures and makes them one. And in marriage, there's two people who are distinct people, two sinners, but somehow in his mystery, just like he's one, it makes them one. It's a beautiful picture meant to mirror or reflect God. It's awesome. Um, And it says, Adam and his wife were both naked. Funny word. They were both naked and they felt no shame. This picture of vulnerable to be fully known by each other, and it's beautiful. Um. One of the things we talked about at Impact Training this past week, if y'all were there, a bunch of y'all were there, it was awesome, um, is that sex is powerful. It's a powerful, powerful thing. Um, It's one of the reasons that culture exalts it and makes it almost godlike is because it's so powerful. Um, And we use the analogy on Friday about a MacBook Pro. Anybody have a MacBook Pro? Y'all rich people got a MacBook Pro? Brand new MacBook Pro. I don't know what y'all spend, but it's like three grand y'all drop on a really nice MacBook Pro. It is a powerful, powerful computer. And if you read the documents on a MacBook Pro, it's going to say something like this. Using this product in a manner different than its intended design will violate the warranty. It'll say something like that. Basically, if you try to use it in the swimming pool, you're, we're not responsible for it. It's meant to be used a certain way. And when you use it that way, it's very powerful. I think, on, I, think I said on Friday, I said, so a MacBook Pro is really cool. It's really powerful. And also other things are really cool. So like when I was a kid, I was obsessed with a boomerang. And I had a boomerang. You know what a boomerang is? 
It's like a curved stick, and you can throw it, but usually when you throw a stick, it just goes, but a boomerang comes back. It's crazy. And a boomerang's cool, and a MacBook Pro is powerful, but if you decide to use the MacBook Pro as a boomerang, it's a bad idea. $3,000 down the drain. And sex is powerful. And when you use it according to its designer's instructions, it's good. And when you misuse it, it's a costly, costly mistake. So when we read scripture, we're going to see, I think we got a slide for this. Purposes of of sex described in scripture. God does not arbitrarily give his commands. He has an intention for them. And one thing we see is that sex's boundaries are the boundaries of marriage. But three purposes for it. One is procreation. Genesis 128. We just read it. This is a controversial statement in some corners, but sex makes babies. Did y'all know that? Sixth grade health class. Thank you very much. (laughs) Sex makes babies. It's supposed to. Sometimes when sex makes babies and we don't intend for it to, we like we think we can control it. We call it an accident. We call it an oops. But it's actually what it's supposed to do. Number two, sex is for pleasure. Song of Solomon is a book in the Bible devoted to marital love. And it describes two lovers and their affection for each other and their enjoyment of each other's bodies. And it mentions children zero times. And so sex is something that two lovers in the context of marriage can enjoy and receive great pleasure from. You know, there are some Christian traditions that reject this idea. St. Augustine believed that Sex was, a, was kind of a useful evil. We needed it for children, but enjoying it too much could take your attention off of God. So you should, do, you should do it to have babies, but you should try your hardest not to like it. Is what he taught, and that's been a stream in certain parts of the Catholic Church for years. But it's meant by God to be pleasurable and fun. Number three, procre- uh, protection. Um, 1 Corinthians 7, 3 through 5, Paul says that in marriage, there is so much immorality in the world. And y'all know this. You face temptations, temptations online, temptations with the person you're dating, temptations for stuff you might do with random people. And Paul says that married couples should be together because it protects them from the temptation that's so rife in the world. And so part of God's design is that it creates this protective Um, bond between a couple. And then the last one is oneness. We mentioned this already from Genesis 2, but it's a picture of the character of God and the love and intensity that he feels for his people. The love that God has for his church is pictured in sexuality. Um, There are some people in culture who are going to make the claim that a lot of the verses we've read are Old Testament. And they'll even say something like, yeah, the Old Testament was all about rules and laws, but Jesus, he's all about grace and love. And so the old way was a bunch of laws and whatnot, but Jesus is all about grace and love. He, does, he never talked about sexuality. He never talked about homosexuality. He just talked about love and acceptance. So y'all, should, we should just love and accept each other and let everybody do, let every Christian do whatever they want. The problem with that is Jesus. And so I, I, think we ta- I think we did this on Friday, but Matthew 19, 4 through 6, here's Jesus' statement on the matter. Matthew 19, haven't you read, Jesus said, that at the beginning, the Creator made them male and female. Does that sound familiar? He's actually quoting Genesis 1 that we just read. So Jesus quoting Genesis, affirming Genesis. So at the beginning, He made them male and female and said, for this reason, a man shall... Leave his father and mother and be united with his wife, and the two become one flesh. He's, what's he quoting now? He's quoting Genesis 2. So he's like saying, Genesis 1, God's design. Genesis 2, God's design. And he's affirming it. So he's affirming what the scriptures picture. And then he takes it to the next level. And he says, so they are no longer two, but one flesh. He gives this commentary. The two become one, and he says they're no longer two, they're one flesh. And then he adds a command. He says, therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. So Jesus affirms Scripture's description from Genesis 1 and 2, 
But then he amplifies it. And he says, God's made a design and no person has the right to contradict it. He doesn't just affirm it. He amplifies it. Um, One thing we talked about on Friday is that if you set a standard, if you create a standard, you then don't have to make a long list of prohibitions on top of the standard you set. So, for example, if you're a teenager, you're 15, you're at home, your mom says, we're going out of town, and I want you to stay home tonight. Don't go out, right? Then your mom leaves, and you say, my mom said stay home, but she didn't say, I can't go dancing. So you decide, I'm going to go out with some friends, I'm going to go dancing, we're going to go out to a restaurant, we're going to go dancing, and then we're going to buy some cigarettes. I'm just trying to think of something random to do. (laughs) Then we're going to buy some cigarettes, then we're going to steal a car, commit some... Commit some thievery. I don't know. (laughs) Hold on here. And then you get home and your mom says, what did you do after you get after she bails you out of jail? And she says, I told you to stay home. And you and then you say to her, but yeah, mom, but you didn't say don't go dancing. You didn't say don't go to a restaurant. You didn't say don't buy cigarettes. And she said, no, I told you what was good and what I expected. I didn't then have to make a list of 50 rules on top of the standard. And God set a standard. And as human, even if God, I think we said this a couple weeks ago, even if God came up, even if God said, here's 20 rules, we're all a little perverted. We'd find number 21 and do it. And so God says, here's the standard. And as Christians, we say, Jesus, you're my Lord. And what you say is my law. So... I love when Jesus talks about this truth, though. He perfectly balances truth with grace because we live in a broken world. And every one of us in this room has made mistakes in our sexuality or in other areas, or if you're me, both. And I love in John chapter 8, this picture of Jesus balancing grace and truth when he confronts the religious leaders who brought him a woman. You remember this story? Who was caught in the act of adultery. And it's a wild story because how did they catch her? Why did they bring her and not the guy who she was committing adultery with? And it says that they were trying to commit, trying to spring this trap on Jesus and get to trick him some way. You remember the story? So they bring him, these religious leaders bring him this woman. And a couple of things it says, it says that they told him the law of Moses, the Old Testament law says that we have to stone her. We have to put her to death for this crime What do you say, Jesus? And Jesus said, they kept demanding an answer. So Jesus stood up and he said, all right, you're right. There's a standard. She broke the standard. So whichever one of you hasn't broken God's standards, you can take the first stone and throw it. Whoever among you is without sin, let him cast the first stone. Remember this story? You remember what it said? It was this really cool picture. It said, and then starting with the oldest down to the youngest, one at a time, they left. Because the oldest had a little bit more maturity and they knew, I'm broken. I've sinned. He got, we were trying to get him and he got me. And one by one, they left until none were left. And Jesus says, does no one condemn you? You know what the crazy thing about the story is? Is everybody who had sin left, except the one guy who had no sin. And that was Jesus who had the right to condemn her because he was the God who made the rule that she broke. And he said, but just like Jesus looks at you and offers you forgiveness, if you just receive it, and he says, neither do I condemn you. And he shows her grace upon grace upon grace. And he gives her her dignity back by embarrassing the ones who had brought her to public shame. But he doesn't leave her like that. And then he says, he gives his last sentence, now go and sin no more. So we're all broken. Jesus offers all of us salvation, but Jesus also calls us to live by his standard. I love the picture of grace and truth. Number two, number two, our sexuality is profoundly important to our spirituality. Our sexuality is profoundly important to our spirituality. You can't grow in your relationship with God if you don't trust him with this area of your life. You will become stagnant. You will be pretending 
If you say to God, God, you can have some of my life, but this part of my life, I get to keep and do what I want. Um, 1 Corinthians 6.18 drives this point home. Um, there's, a, there's a saying I've heard in church a bunch of times, all sin is the same in God's eyes. You believe that? I kind of believe it, and I kind of don't. I think the Bible kind of teaches it, and I think the Bible kind of doesn't. Because here's what all sin does. From the little white lie told by a child to the most heinous crime, all sin shows I'm a sinner who needs a Savior. So in that sense, all sin's the same. But not all sin affects my soul as deeply and affects others around me as profoundly. 1 Corinthians 6.18 says sexual sin's in that category. He says... Paul, the Apostle Paul says, run from sexual sin. No other sin so clearly affects the body as this one does. For sexual immorality is a sin against your own body, against your own flesh and blood. Don't you realize that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and was given to you by God? You know, if you're a Christian, God's in you. And then if you take your body and sin with it in this way, it implicates God in the crime, in a way that hurts your soul. He says, you don't belong to yourself. You, God, bought you with a price, so honor God with your body. Sexual sin, according to the Apostle Paul, affects your relationship with God more profoundly than many other sins. The word for sexual immorality in that verse is a Greek word, porneia. Sound familiar? There's a little thing that's on the internet that you may have heard of called pornography. We get the word from it. But in the context, porneia basically was this big umbrella word that encompassed basically everything that wasn't good in the area of sexuality. So porneia is like a, a, a big umbrella junk drawer word for anything that violates God's standard. So some people can say, well, what about sex before marriage? That's porneia. What about cheating? That's porneia. What about same-sex relationships? That's porneia. And God says, avoid porneia. Um, so, and the reason God says that is because God loves you. He wants what's best for you. He doesn't give us arbitrary rules for no reason. He cares about your soul and he cares about your future. Um, so, um, there's a weird idea in culture and in some of my doctoral studies, I've been thinking about this. I've been reading on this idea. Some people call it the idea of human embodiment. Our physical bodies matter more than we think. Um, you know, if I, I'm trying to pick somebody on the front row, Wade. I'll pick on Wade for a minute. <laughs> if I made Wade stand up here and I said, Wade, just stand there, close your eyes, and I punched Wade in the face. <laughs> Sorry, Wade. You picked... You pick the front row, man. <laughs> and I punch Wade in the face. And Wade started to get all mad at me, all upset. And you say, no, 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 Wade, wait, it's okay, it's okay. I didn't hit you. I just hit your body. <laughs> but the real you is like your soul. The real you is like deep down inside of you. So I didn't hit the real you. I just hit this like temporary shell, this temporary tent. No, Wade's going to be pretty ticked off because I didn't just hit his body. I hit Wade, Right? Because what happens to our bodies happens to us. You are your body. Your body is you. God didn't create an immaterial soul named Adam and then look around and fashion a body and then stick Adam's immaterial soul and then the body dies and then that soul. When Jesus died on the cross, it wasn't this ghost of a soul that went to be with God. It was his physical body that raised from the dead. And the hope we have as Christians isn't that our physical, that, that like we'll be separated from our bodies and we'll float up to heaven and we'll play a harp on a cloud in heaven. Our hope is that just like Jesus' body came back to life, we'll be able to conquer death the way he did. And we'll be raised from death to life, not in some metaphorical sense, but actually alive physically alive. And God cares. You know, if you talk to somebody, be sensitive here, who was abused. They don't say, somebody abused my body. They say they abused me. 
God cares what others do to your body because that was you that was hurt. And God cares what you do to your body because what we do with our body affects our soul. In the early church, there was a false teaching called Gnosticism. Have you heard that word before? The Gnostics. It was actually, um, there was this Greek philosophy with these people who followed the, the Greek philosopher Plato. Not Plato, Plato. Plato, Aristotle, Socrates, maybe you did the world. You remember from world history. They, they took Plato's philosophy. They married it to Christianity. They followed Plato but used Christian terminology. We called them the Gnostics. And one of the things Plato said is that the body's imperfect, but your soul or your spirit's perfect. And so basically, if you're a Christian, your soul belongs to God, and you can do whatever you want with your body. So the Gnostics, actually, they went to one of two extremes. Some of them despised their bodies, and they punished their bodies, and they starved their bodies, and they fasted, and they wore sackcloth, and they, they whipped themselves, and some indulged their bodies. And they said, we can have all the sex with prostitutes that we want, because it's not me doing that, it's just my body. And we think that's crazy, but it's the philosophy that our world has. I can do anything I want. It doesn't affect my soul. Um, in many, many, And there are also other ways we reject God's ideals for our body. If we become obsessed with our appearance, if we hate our appearance, if we exercise to the point of vanity, if we engage in sexual activity, we're treating our bodies in a way that God didn't intend. But your sexuality, what you do with your body, affects your soul. And then point number three, last point. We should expect culture to push back on God's design for sexuality. Everything in us says this. Everything in our broken, fallen selves says this is bad. Culture says this is not correct. The devil himself wants us to live in a different way. Tim Shalise is a pastor. Um... And he says that culture doesn't just have one view of what sex is all about. It actually has three different views. So let me tell you what he says the three views are. And you can tell me, you probably have seen all three views. He says, one, sex is appetite. Sex is a natural appetite like hunger. It's just a physical urge. Having sex is no more immoral than eating food. And we're basically like animals. And so to deprive someone of sex is like depriving a child of food. And it's bad. Um, They actually said that in the New Testament world. In 1 Corinthians 6.13, Paul quotes people who said, food is meant for the stomach and the stomach for food. And basically they were trying to say, when I have an urge, I should fill my urge. This is not a new idea, but you've heard that in culture. Number two, he says, another view is sex as affection. Sex is simply how two people express their love for one another. So to forbid sex is to invalidate love. And what they're really saying is, I can't love somebody unless I'm having sex with them. And so this sex as affection is used to justify same-sex marriage. It's also used to justify divorce when we fall out of love. And then the third view that culture suggests is that sex is fulfillment. Sex is fulfillment. In other words, sex is is a key part of my identity. Sex is a key part of my identity. And if I don't have freedom to do what I want to do and freedom to identify how I want to identify, then I'm an incomplete person. And this is where we're getting into some of the stuff that's so controversial now. Sex is about individual, in this view, sex is about individual fulfillment and not something I give to someone else to serve them. It's just about my individual fulfillment and who I am. It's certainly not to glorify God. And as a Christian, listen to this. Your ultimate identity, your ultimate fulfillment comes from Jesus Christ. And sex is a gift from God to be enjoyed, but it is not who you are. And we have a movement in culture that wants to say that my sexual identity, my gender identity, my attractions to whichever gender is who I am first and foremost. And I want you to tell you this, if this is, if this is you and you're tempted, you're, you're wrestling with these ideas, maybe you have a friend who's not a Christian, but they're gay. The, what they need is not morality, ultimately. 
what they ultimately need is to say, I want to find my deepest identity in my creator who made my soul, who has a beautiful plan for my life, and not get my identity from lesser things. Not get my identity from taking something that God made as a gift and making the gift my God, but get my identity from my God. And so uh, I, I had somebody ask me this question last week. They said, I have a friend, and they're gay, and, but they're not a Christian, but I want to talk to him about Jesus, but it comes up every time we talk. How do I talk to them? Like, how do I, how do I talk to them about Jesus without just talking only about sexuality? And I said, maybe we make the conversation, we shift it to identity and say, what is your ultimate, ultimate identity, satisfaction, and where, where, where is it found? And I don't want you to settle for something less than Jesus. Um, bad news, you will be called judgmental, you will be called bigoted, Unless you clearly reject Jesus' teaching on sexuality. I know the world y'all live in. I know the friends. I know the people that are in the culture. I know the messages that are being sent on social media. You know, the first believer in Jesus who was martyred, who was killed, was John the Baptist. We don't know if we call him a Christian or not yet because he didn't survive until Jesus was raised from the dead. So do you have to be a... Get, did, you have to be on that side of the resurrection to know. But John acknowledged that Jesus was the Savior. But you remember how he died? He was a preacher. He was proclaiming God's truth. He lived the same time as Jesus. He said, this is the Savior who's been prophesied, who's been predicted. But one of the things John did is there was this king, this, this kind, of, kind of regional ruler named Herod Antipas. And Herod did kind of a weird thing. He uh, married his brother's ex-wife. He married his sister-in-law. And, this, and, and Herod claimed to be a Jew, claimed to follow the Jewish law, but he did this thing that was forbidden by the Jewish law. So John was preaching against it. He's saying, you claim you're one of us, but you're violating our law. So John preached against it. It made Herod pretty upset that crazy John was talking about his bedroom life. So Herod puts him in jail. Long story short, he has a party. As part of the party, they cut John's head off. The first martyr was martyred for preaching against the sexual misconduct of powerful people in the culture. You will be called judgmental and bigoted unless you reject Jesus' teaching on sexuality. Some people say Christians are more known for what they're against, and we don't want to be known for what we're against. But we are for loving God, and there's some... but. Sometimes being for something means you have to be opposed to things that are against the thing you love. And so what I'm not talking about is being a cultural crusader. What I am talking about is striving in my own life to live a holy life. And to be for what God calls good and against what God calls bad. Um, some people say it's time for the church to change its view on these topics. But here's what you need to know. There's actually been a... 2,000-year consensus among Christians, Christians who've been separated by time, separated by geography, by culture, by ethnicity, there's been a 2,000-year consensus on all of these things. These are Christians who've been separated by every possible factor possible. So like factor possible. So Christians who are rich, Christians who are poor, Christians who lived in Europe, in Asia, in Africa, in the Americas. Christians of every skin tone, Catholics who are very formal, and Pentecostals who swing from the chandeliers agree on these topics. Baptists and Methodists and rich and poor all agree that this is God's standard, and it hasn't been until the last five minutes in the grand scheme of human history. In the 1960s, what we called the sexual revolution changed everything. Just a sentence or two about that. You know, our, uh, uh, this movement that started in the 60s, I think we got a slide for the sexual revolution. Y'all remember that? Good times, right? Make love, not war. Nudity is God's gift. You remember this? World War II happened. All the GIs come home. They have a lot of kids. The baby boomers, the baby boomers hit the college campus, and all of a sudden, they get life handed to them on a silver platter, and they say, this is our time to change everything. And they, they had this movement 
where they question every sexual standard that had come before. What they were interested in was not, what they're interested in was not a reformation. Let's fix a few things that are broken. You know, a reformation is let's improve what we have. A revolution is where we burn what exists to the ground so we can remake something new. And every revolution in human history has had a body count. There's a great philosopher named Dr. Phil. You know Dr. Phil? He's on the TV. And I've got a bunch of slides that we're going to skip for time's sake. But if you look at the legacy of the sexual revolution, how they've said we need to, we need to eliminate the concept of gender. We need to eliminate the connection between sex and marriage. We actually need to eliminate the concept between sex and childbearing. The pill made it possible to have sex without having kids. The problem is sometimes you still have kids. And so abortion became a sacred right that people were willing to fight for in sexuality. And abortions left 60 million dead in our country in the last 45 years. There's a body count. And so sex outside of marriage causes untold hardship. Children outside of the context of marriage. Fatherless children, some of your story in this room, so much heartache. And so if you look at the fruit of the sexual revolution, you look at the way culture is now, I'm not sure that it's been a good revolution. Dr. Phil has this thing where he brings people onto his show, and they're usually dysfunctional people, and they're like fighting with each other, and then there's somebody who's really made a mess of their life, And they're like telling Dr. Phil while they're right, even though the consequences are really, really bad. And so they're like telling Dr. Phil all the reason. And Dr. Phil has this thing that he does almost every time. He like leans in and he looks out and he says, okay, I hear what you're saying. How's that working out for you? (laughs) And sometimes we think we should be ashamed of our, the, the moral, the ethical standards that as Christians we uphold. When really you look at what culture's doing to themselves, And we ought to say, God, thank you for your wisdom. Because what they're doing ain't working. And I know there's sin in the church, and I know there's sin in my life and in this room. But God, living life God's way is how life works best. Um, If you're you're interested in kind of the, the way, some deep teaching on sexual revolution, that we did impact training two weeks ago, and I unpacked. The sexual revolution and the philo- it's kind of the philosophy that started 200 years ago in Europe that led to this notion that my sex define sex defines my identity, and so we talked through that. You can pick you can watch that on our YouTube channel. Uh, but for now, I'm going to skip to um, I'm going to skip to Galatians three, Tate. Galatians three twenty six is a passage that. Um, I've heard my whole life, but just a few weeks ago, my wife gave me this really interesting insight into the passage. And she said, because we were teaching on these topics, and if you know Galatians 3, it's where it says, for there is neither Jew nor Gentile. Being a Christian breaks down ethnic barriers. Neither slave nor free. It breaks down socioeconomic barriers. Neither male nor female. Being a Christian breaks down gender barriers. You're all one in Christ. Um, because even then, people created all of these barriers where they looked at ethnicity, they looked at money, they looked at gender for their identity. But look at Galatians 3.26, how it started. He said, so in Christ Jesus, here's your identity. You are children of God by faith. So some in this room, you're not yet a Christian. You haven't said to Jesus, you are my Lord. And when we do that, we, in our hearts, we bow our knee to Jesus and we say, Jesus, I want to follow you and believe in you. Jesus says, and I will receive you as my child. And so it says, Jesus, so in Jesus Christ, you are children of God through faith. For you've been baptized into Christ. So you're in Christ and you've been clothed. With Christ. I love the picture of if you're a Christian, Christ is in you and Christ is wrapped around you. Your identity, if you're a Christian, is Christ. It's not Jew or Gentile, it's not your ethnicity. There's some 
people in culture who want to make ethnic identity or racial identity number one. If you're a Christian, your Christian identity is number one. It's not slave or free. Sometimes we say, I want to get rich. That's what my life's all about. Make your money, do whatever. But your identity, first and foremost, has to be in Jesus. It's not slave nor free. It's not male nor female. It's not your sexuality. It is Jesus Christ. And in the culture, when people settle for anything else, they're settling for second best. So let's point people not to sexuality, but to Jesus. So three applications, and I'm going to invite Eric to come back up and close us in a song. One is love Jesus more than anything else. If you're not a Christian, you can become one. During this song, you could cry out in prayer to Jesus, Jesus, save me, and the Bible says He will. The Bible says if we confess our sins, I'm a sinner, I need you, Jesus. He's faithful and just. He'll forgive you your sins, cleanse you from all unrighteousness. So love Jesus more than than anything. Number two, strive to live out God's design in your sexuality. First Peter, one, First Peter says, be holy. The, the, God says, be holy because I'm holy. The standard of a Christian is to try our best to live like Jesus with his help. So strive to live it out. If you're addicted to porn, if you're doing stuff with a person you're dating, you shouldn't. Strive to live for Jesus. And then last thing, Humbly resist the pressure to compromise your convictions. God's standards are good. Don't doubt that. Let me pray for us and we'll close with a song. Thank you, guys. Father, thank you so much for creating us. Thank you that every man and woman in this room is your creation, made by you, stamped with your image. God, I know there's some people in this room struggling with their own self-worth and value. For because of words that have been said to them that are hurtful or because of things they've done, I pray they'd know that they are loved by you, made by you, full of value. Thank you for your image on every one of us. But also, God, thank you that your standards your, for us are good. I pray we'd embrace them. And thank you for Jesus that even when we fall short, we have a Savior who meets us in our time of need forgives our sin and heals us. God, give us the courage to stand in a culture that's opposed to your ways. And please let us be your ambassadors to reflect your image, represent you in this culture well. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand and worship together.